Hi folks, it's that time of the week when I give my sermon. We are very excited that this week we will be opening up Monday and Thursday for services and all being well in the future as well. Um, very excited that this week we will be opening up services Monday and Thursday and in the coming weeks we will eventually be getting back to Shabbos services as well, all being well. We hope those of you who feel safe and comfortable to do so will join us um, in person with all the safety requirements in place, of course. We start as ever with prayers for those who are unwell and for our general situation, which is still challenging. Please turn to page 510 in the singers if you're using it. Join in with me. May I in I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come? It comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot stumble. He who guards you does not slumber. The guardian of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The Lord is your guardian in your shade at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will guard you from all harm. He will guard your life. He will guard your going and coming now and forevermore. We start, we continue with prayers for those who are unwell. If people have names, please insert them at your own, uh, in your own prayers at the appropriate point. If you want us to say them regularly, please let us know and we will do so. Yes, yes, of Ben Miriam, yes, Chaya Fege, Bas Pesha, yes, Yoy, Bernish Pinchas, Ben Miriam, yes, Chana Bas Nechama, yes, Chaim Tobia, Dobby, Ben Chaya Leia, yes, Avram Shrag, Ben Sora Tavira, yes, Bosch Shiva, Ben Freyno, yes, Pes Chaya, Ben Shane Gita, yes, Shiva Zam, Ben Chana Liba, yes, Moshe Gershon, Ben Fege, yes, Yeshua Chuna, Ben Miriam, yes, Shlomo, Ben Mindo, yes, Avram, Ben Sora Peril, yes, Moshe Ali Melech, Ben Masha Fege, Yes, Mordechai David ben Tzero, yes, Yaakov ben Miriam, yes, Michal ben Henya, yes, Yonason ben Sora, yes, Kassio ben Fredo, yes, Pinchas ben Liba, yes, Yezu ben Rezachaya, yes, Baruch ben Tovachaya, yes, Yudha Chaim ben Esther Brach, yes, Shmuel Yudhaven ben Nechama Esther, yes, Shmuel Yudha ben Kayla, yes, Rufal Hosh, Yonah ben Chana, yes, Yumiya ben Sora, yes, Wolf ben Polin, yes, Yitzhak Isaac ben Yudhis Rachel, Yes, Nosson ben Shalom, yes, Mary ben Malcolm, yes, Tobit ben Tova, yes, Moshe ben Ben Shifra Rochem, yes, Malcolm bas Chana, yes, Chana bas Tavora, yes, Esther bas Rochem, yes, Herschel bas Rochel, yes, Francis bas Herschel, yes, Nea bas Karen, yes, Yael bas Soros, Dina bas Sora, yes, Tavora bas Gittel, yes, Sima Masha bas Yach, yes, Shlamas bas Chayaliba, yes, Tavora bas Sora Liba, yes, Gali bas Sora, yes, Yudis bas Bain, yes, Nea bas Eto, and we wish on life to those with yacht site this morning. Uh, sorry, this, this coming week, as follows. Tomorrow, Shabbos, Philippa Garland for her mother, Stuart Hertzberg for his mother, 
Barry Lazarus for his father, Belinda Taylor for her mother. On Sunday, Malcolm Lax for his mother, Arnold Levan for his mother, and Elaine Mitchell for her father. On Monday, Michael Bentley for his mother, Maureen Garth for her mother, Linda Levy for her father, David Rose for his father, and Susan Waterman for her father. On Tuesday, Renee Don for her husband, Maureen Lubert for her mother, and Hazel Hostel for her father. On Wednesday, Monty Alkinson for his wife, Sheila Groman for her mother-in-law, Arnold Levan for his wife, Polina Mansour for her mother, and Bernie West for his wife. On Thursday, Roberta Curtis for her husband, Brian Deal for his mother, Craig Goldman for his father, and Amelia Rose for her mother. And on Friday, Jeffrey Goldwater for his mother, Karen Jay for her mother, Gillian Richards for her mother, Kitty Selby for her sister, and Serena Strong for her father. Wish everyone long life, and also condolences to Deborah Markham on the passing of her mother, Eva Sherman. We wish her long life, along with her family, Chaim Aruchim. Yes, <laughs> Yes, Shlomo ben Mendel HaKoyen, Yes, Beile Bas Ruven, Yes, Chana Bas Yitzchok, Yes, Malkus Vore Bas Seifuf, Yes, Yosef ben Yitzchok, Yehuda, Shalchu Elein Amam, Hana Barachimim, Asirim B'Tzezek, and Vav Yoy Lamim, Yitzchok B'Tzachim is Nishma, Samad Noi Nachla Sam, Yenuch Mishem Vishkoi Sam, V'Noi Mar, Amen. We wish Mazel Tov to Nicole Fenton, Robert Fine, Michael Rainsby, Frank Berylson, Natasha Brett and Diane Nathan on their birthdays, to Brenda and Jeff on their diamond wedding anniversary, the Bendens, Mazel Tov to you, and to David Berg on the birth of a grandson, Milo Lewis, a nephew also for Robert and Laura, wish everyone Mazel Tov, and wish Mazel Tov also to Josh Richards on his engagement, lovely news, wish everyone Mazel Tov, please God we will celebrate Simchas in person in the very near future. There is a lot of discussion in Jewish law about kavana. Kavana means one's intent. What is one's intention? So, for example, when I do a mitzvah, do I have to have intent? Do I have to concentrate? Do I have to know what I'm doing? Or is it enough that I did the mitzvah? So, uh, ultimately, actions are what counts. We say that a lot in Judaism. I'll give you an example. That happened to me a few years ago. Um, I think I was outside one of the local kosher shops. It was Sukkot. I had my lulav and etrog with me. I asked a couple of people, would you like to do the mitzvah? And one particularly bad-tempered person says, mm, gosh, all right, just to get you off my back, takes the lulav and etrog, you know, nearly whacks me in the face with it, says the brocha through clenched teeth, and the whole thing was pretty unpleasant, and off we go. Anyway, I get a call later from this chap, somebody I knew. He says, Rabbi, I must apologize for my behavior earlier. You know, nothing to do with you. I was just having a rough day, and I shouldn't have been so disrespectful. I would like to come round and shake the lulav again with the right attitude. I said, you're welcome to do that, but you don't need to, and you don't need to make a bracha. Why? Because you did it already. But Rabbi, I didn't have any thought or concentration. You did the deed. But should we have kavanah? Should we have the right approach? Of course we should. But nonetheless, right, I'll put it in very simple terms. If you're someone collecting tzedakah, do you care what the intention is of the person putting money in the jar or in the bank, or are you simply happy to have the money? So generally speaking, kavanah, of course, is important. And there are areas, particularly in davening, it's not enough to just say the words, you have to mean it. But when we do a mitzvah, the main thing is to do the mitzvah. There are a couple of exceptions which I just wanted to touch on because they're very relevant to our lives and to this week. This week, the 17th of Tammuz, on Thursday, begins the period of time of the three weeks when we mourn the destruction of the Temple and of Jerusalem. And we fast on the 17th of Tammuz. And we've been learning about this in our morning shi'or after davening in the mornings. And more of that in a moment. And also the fact that many of us are unable to say Kaddish for our loved ones. We're unable to pray together with a quorum. We're unable to do many of the mitzvot that we would normally take for granted um, in one way or another. There may be people who won't be able to fast on Thursday because of health concerns. There's a whole question in a pandemic about fasting. So I wanted to look at these kind of issues of kavanah, of intent. Because whilst generally speaking we say that You've got to do the mitzvah. And by the same token, if I say, I am intending to put on tefillin today, and I don't do it, it doesn't tick the box. I'm going to daven, but I didn't do it. I'm going to give a donation to charity, 
but I didn't do it, it doesn't tick the box. So there are a couple of interesting exceptions which I wanted to look at. There's a famous story which was going around at the beginning of all of this, which I love. Um, I don't remember who it was. But there were two Hasidim in, uh, in, I think it was in Russia, and they were thrown into prison. And I don't know if you've been to prison recently, hopefully not, but certainly Russian prisons were nothing special. And amongst other things, they had a bucket uh, where you would do your uh, doings. There were no toilet facilities, no ensuite. So they were smelly, dirty places. These two Hasidim were thrown into jail for uh, probably spreading Judaism. It was something like that. And it's time to daven. Maybe it was Mincha, I don't know, afternoon service. And one says to the other, we have to daven. Come on. The other says, we can't daven. It stinks in here. There's a big bucket of human waste. We cannot pray in here. We're not allowed. They have a whole discussion about it. Their third cellmate, who's not Jewish, is a bit amused by all of this. Anyway, the two Hasidim are arguing and talking in Yiddish. And finally, one says to the other, wait a minute. He says, what are we complaining about? He says, the same God that told us to pray three times a day also told us that you can't pray in a disgusting, stinky place. So by not dabbling in this cell right now where it stinks and it's disgusting, we are fulfilling God's will. Just because we don't see it that way. We should be happy. And the two Hasidim are so happy, they start dancing and singing and it gets louder and louder and they're clapping and they're dancing and they're singing around this pail of uh, dirty human waste. Anyway, the guards come along, what's the commotion? And the guards say to the, uh, to the non-Jewish cellmate, well, what's with these guys? These Meshuggah, what are they doing? He says, I don't know anything about anything. He says, all I can tell you is they've been pointing at that pail of human waste and they've been laughing and they've been joyous the whole time. So the guards say, if that's what's making them happy, we'll take it away. They take the bucket away, smell improves, and the Hasidim were able to daven mincha. It's a cute story. That's not even the point. Even if they hadn't been able to daven, it's, it's the point. The same God that told us to keep Shabbat told us we're allowed to break Shabbat if somebody's life is in danger. The same God who says in the Torah that you fa- if you don't fast on Yom Kippur, you're cut off, your soul is cut off, tells you you cannot fast on Yom Kippur if it will endanger your life. The same God that tells you you should pray with a minion also tells you there are times when you can't do that. You can't even pray possibly. So one of the things we've had to really internalize, many of us, myself included, over the last few months, and I was very aware of it as we start to try to get back to Shul and hopefully have Minyanim and pray together and say Kaddish together, is the idea that we get hung up on our idea of what God wants from us. But that's not always the case. The same God that told us to build Shuls and go down in them told us to stay home when necessary. It's a very sobering thought that we get caught up in our preconceived ideas of what Hashem wants from us. Maybe sometimes He wants something different. And this week, Sedra, Chukat, which is all about the red heifer, contains a very curious process. Nobody understands it. It says even King Solomon, the wisest of men, struggled with understanding the rationale of how burning the ashes of a red cow could help to purify a person. But besides that, there's something even stranger. The people involved in the process themselves, somebody had to administer the rites, the process, to those who were tamay, those who were impure. The people who did that, those who were on duty helping to purify those people who had Tumar needed purification from contact with the dead body, which, by the way, often meant they'd been doing Hefra Kaddisha work. They weren't evil people, right? They could be holy people doing Hefra Kaddisha work. They were Tamei. They needed purifying. The people who helped them, says the Torah, they themselves became Tamei impure as well. Not quite to the same degree, but they required a purification. So let's look at this. Someone comes up to you and says, I'm looking for a volunteer. You say, go on, yes. Um, I'm looking for a volunteer who's basically going to roll in the mud to help another person get clean. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm not doing that. I'm willing to help the guy up, but I'm not going to bring myself down to such a level and dirty and sully myself. So the Torah is saying you have to be prepared to put yourself on the line for another person. You've got to be prepared to make yourself tummy, which is not something you should do. But for another person, you can do that. You can put your own happiness, your own spirituality on the line for your love for another Jew to help another person. That's pretty mind-blowing. It's pretty earth-shattering. I raised it in our shir this week, and I, I'm very pleased to say that nobody batted an eyelid. Everyone said, well, of course. What do you mean? You have to sometimes give of yourself to help another person. Sometimes you have to even lower your own expectations. You know, it might be I want to spend a certain amount of time doing, I don't know, studying or praying. But I can't do that because I need to spend some time helping another person out. I want to spend a certain amount of time with things that are important to me, whether it's my hobbies, my family. But I'm prepared to give that up, to give up my own development, my own growth, my own spirituality, sometimes my own holiness even, to help another person, which of course is a very noble and holy aim. So 
I think if you go back a few generations and you, you talk about these concepts that we take for granted of outreach, of helping others, of volunteering, people didn't always identify with that. You know, it was always, I have to keep my standards. If I'm okay, I'm all right, Jack. Not in my backyard, the problem is somewhere else. Whereas nowadays we know we say the problem is all of ours to help others. Whether it's helping others during the coronavirus with volunteering. Whether it's helping other people spiritually. Whether it's going over to someone in Shul and helping them say Kaddish. Possibly missing out some of your own davening or something like that. Helping someone put on tefillin, which will be challenging, but we'll figure out a way to do it. It's second nature to most of us. We've grown up with it, but it's, it's not obvious that you give of yourself to help another person. That's an incredible concept. And it's the same idea. Are we doing what we want or what God wants? God wants us to love our fellow. So he wants us to put ourselves on the line for others. It fits with his plan. We may think his plan is to sit and study and pray and do mitzvah in our own little bubble, as it were. But God says, no, you have to get out of your bubble within government guidelines. You have to get out of your bubble. So that's what we learn from this week's center. I think it's very topical to us in the times we're in. The other thing is the idea of kavanah. So it's interesting. We're coming up to a fast day and we just learned this this morning. The point of fasting is not to deprive yourself of food and drink. The point of fasting is to give a message to God that you are contrite and that you are thinking about what you're doing. And it says, we learn from the book of Jonah, that when God saw the people of Nineveh, he didn't see their sackcloth and their fasting, he saw their deeds, their actions, what their actions stood for. And we see in the book of Daniel, it says, that when Daniel pledged to God that he was going to fast, God forgave him for what he needed to. So normally we say, actions speak louder than words. Normally we say, kavanah is important, but you've got to do the deed. When it comes to something like fasting, the idea is not to deprive yourself of food and drink. The idea is the message, the symbolism. If you can internalize that, even before you actually fast. The discussion, I think, was in a pandemic, let's say, if it's not safe to fast and you want to fast because you're concerned and you want to do Teshuvah, you want to fast, and you make a pledge that as soon as as it's safe to do so, I will fast. God says it's as if you fasted. It's the same effect. We don't normally say that. If you pledge charity and don't give it, it doesn't help. But we say, it's not the fasting, it's what's behind it. So as we start the three weeks, this Thursday we fast. Let's remember, it's not about missing food and drink. It's about what that represents. And when we have the right kavanah, the right intention of what that represents, of contrition, of understanding that we can always do better, of pain over the past, particularly the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem, when we have that, even if we don't manage to fast for health reasons, or it gets delayed, or even if we do fast, that's not what it's all about. It's about what's going through our minds and our hearts as well. So as we prepare to return to shore, and once again, those who are at home, please remain at home if you need to. We will do as much live stream as we can to include people in ways that we perhaps never did in the past. And hopefully that will continue to be a positive thing. And we will all stay safe. We will gather together. We will pray for our loved ones. We will say Kaddish for our loved ones and we will daven together. And we should all remember, number one, Sometimes you have to put yourself out to help another person. That's Judaism. That's in the Torah. Sometimes what God asks from us is different from what we think he's asking from us. Again, that's Judaism. That's how Hashem works. We don't really understand. The same God that tells us one thing also tells us another. And we should celebrate that with joy, even when it's difficult, like staying home and closing our shores. And finally, Normally we say actions speak louder than words. When it comes to certain things, when it comes to contrition, when it comes to teshuvah, when it comes to growth, when it comes to regret, when it comes to fasting and mourning, it's not just the symbolic gestures, it's what's behind them. If we can tap into what's behind them, then that counts for more even than the gestures themselves. I look forward to seeing everyone at some point in the near future. I wish everyone a wonderful week and a Shabbat Shalom.